2016, this year, you got an award called New African Woman of the Year. Why do you think you received that award? I think that award, as far as I'm concerned, was essentially for women of the continent. I got that award because I've been working for the past three years plus on the whole area of uh, financial inclusion, more or less, broadly speaking. And being at the African Development Bank as Special Envoy on Gender, my focus was very much on how can we deal with women in business and ensure that they are able to be real uh, stakeholders and role players in this area. It was also because one was sort of sailing close to the wind mm -hmm. and trying to follow the money and ensure that women aren't marginalised to peripheral areas, but that we actually bring women into infrastructure, so looking at inclusive infrastructure, bringing women into the energy sector. It's still a battle, but uh, the voices are being heard. And then looking at women entrepreneurs and how we can move women as being associated with micro business and the survivalist sector to women in the missing middle and, and hopefully work towards women being industrialists. But it was also because one had this endeavor that you know, you need to look at a whole ecosystem when you want to change things. And this is also about change management, but really calling out those who would say, you know, you talk about women in business, we don't really know if there's real money. And the reality is, this is at the end of the day, the third largest market, if we want to look at it in that way. It's second to India and China um, as a mar market. But it's also because you want to use the talent pool that's available in the continent, in a country. And 2016 is the year when the SDGs were adopted. So in short, it wasn't just about Geraldine Fraser Moleketti, it was also raising this issue up. Uh, to the top and, uh, you know, recognizing where a bit of work has been done. What is the SDGs? What do you refer to? The Sustainable Development Goals. Um, you know, we had adopted the Sustainable Development Goals at the level of the United Nations Development Programme. It was uh, adopted last year, actually, in August. And those goals has goal five, which is one that looks at gender equality. But the commitment to women and their involvement in all areas of society means that every SDG, Sustainable Development Goal, has to take that into account. So it's uh, trying to break down patriarchy, not just one block at a time, it's, it's actually looking at how we can make a difference because at the end of the day, uh, the longer you have patriarchy, the less likely there's a consideration of equality of people. And after all, as South Africans, we made a commitment in 1994 with uh, the first parliament, 1996 with our first constitution, and the first parliament was democratic, mind you, with the first constitution, we were very clear about the equality of people, irrespective of race, sex, gender, and sexual orientation. And this is taking that forward and ensuring that you involve all people, irrespective of who they are, where they are, and irrespective of color, class, or creed. It's not always easy to achieve. It's easier to commit to the rhetoric than to the implementation. So I think it's really pushing to make that happen. But we're facing on the continent, from South Africa to the, the north, northeast, west, south, on the continent, a quite a solid male sovereignistic domination in all the areas, all facets of, sort of, of people's life political, economic, and social. And you're suggesting 
that by doing the work that you're doing on women's emancipation, you actually break that veil. Is that possible? Of course it is. Many people would have told us 50 years ago that apartheid was there at infinitum. And we didn't wait for permission to challenge it. And mind you, when we challenged an uh, apartheid regime that we saw as completely discriminating, dehumanizing, we still see the impacts on that of people's lives. We didn't limit it to non-racialism. We also spoke about the uh, struggle of non-sexism. And that's why in the Congress movement as a whole, there was always a reference to the triple oppression of women. It's your oppression as a woman, it was your oppression as a black woman, it was also your oppression as a working class woman. So it was always there. So it's not a new concept. Also, we must remember changing thinking in society doesn't take one sex only. So it's not just women who are going to fight it. It's men as well. And the irony of it that is that I don't think enough is being done at the community and family unit to challenge uh, stereotyping and discrimination. So yes, you say North, whether Egypt, so Cairo or Cape Town or Mozambique, there are challenges. But on the other hand, you have some shining lights. You have a country like Rwanda that has more than 60% of women in the legislature. And when you look at uh, the laws in that country, especially as it relates to land and property, you know, it looks at property ownership for both men and women. So when you are, when you are married, both the husband and wife have equal, equal access to the land as collateral. And that was part of the legal environment. So I'm not looking at the whole issue of women's emancipation narrowly from a normative perspective. I'm also saying, what makes sense to society? And at the end of the day, as I said earlier, you want to have men and women in building an economy. And we know, and let's look at the area of private equity. Uh, men are risk takers when it comes to investment and equity. Women are more cautious. So you actually need the two together for good investment. So another example or anecdote is Vietnam. You know, one of the large uh, investment companies is being headed up by women there. And again, it's, you know, ensuring that your investment is actually going to be quite secure. So I say, come back again. What we want is we want the best talent pool. So it's not to push out anyone. It's actually saying that, you know, it's about equality. Whether you a boy or a girl, you must have an equal chance in society. You must have choice. You must have opportunity to education. You must have opportunity to become president of the country, irrespective of who you are. That, that reminds me of the ANC's conference, um, where the one-third issue of women representation came up. And Masiwa Teo Lakota was in a debate with Nelson Mandela on issue of merit versus creating special places for women. And then Mandela indicated that the majority was always right because it, there was a push to put it to a vote. And Mandela indicated that the majority was over his experience in prison is that the majority is not always right on these matters. And it requires a degree of leadership and cogent thinking around that. Why was that quite a debate on the women's representation? If you, um. had, you come out of a liberation movement that claims all these things that you're claiming, why was that debate so... You know, I, I would actually take that further. It's, it's in essence patriarchy consolidating. You know, if there's one thing that's universal, it's patriarchy. So no question about it. We see that in any instances, if there's a view that you may be rocking the status quo, you're going to get resistance. 
But I would be very careful about using the argument of merit because you're talking about merit of whom? Because at the end of the day, uh, it could be the same argument that you use against men. So what makes you, Daniel, any better than me? If we have equal opportunity and we have both have the ability to study and get a PhD, why would uh, people choose Daniel and not choose Geraldine and I think we must be careful because sometimes we argue about merit when you have to bring in women and you don't use that argument for men so you are comfortable with, mediocri uh, with mediocrity amongst men and yet you don't want to bring a good woman in because look at Africa, look at the world and a bit of the mess that's there at the moment. I don't see as many women in leadership that's creating the turmoil. And I'm not going to automatically assume that women won't make mistakes. So I think we must be careful about this debate on merit and how narrow we go. Because on the other hand, that very debate was used against bringing black people and I use the term black in its broadest term in South Africa, in the South African context. So you wouldn't want to bring black people because you'll say, what uh, experience do, you, do they have? But on the other hand, in 1994, when we entered government, there was no South African in South Africa that had an experience within South Africa of being and heading up any institution that was a democratic institution that didn't discriminate on people, against people on the basis of race. Now I'm not talking about people who may have had experience outside South Africa and been exposed to more democratic societies than South Africa was. And yet there were those who would argue that there wasn't uh, experience. So we all had to build that experience as South Africans and we cut our teeth as pioneers. The class of 1994, if I can use that, um, actually went and said, we are going to work on this together. And they were activists, they were academics, they were people from the private sector. There were those at that point who were part of what was the old order, but ready, willingly or unwillingly, to help build a democratic society. There were those from the new order who willingly or unwillingly worked with those who were protagonists before and all, but we had to build something. Now everybody's ready to say, but just hold it, you know, we were ready to take that leap as it came to race and color we're not so sure if we will do it with gender. I think that's double standards. And that's why I wouldn't entertain such a debate. I would say, let's look at what everyone has to offer. Let's look at the platform and let's look at the talent pool and let's get the best team to work in any area or sector of society. At a very tender age, you, you decided um, from being part of the political process as a PwC to leave the country. Um, and many would say you, you sacrificed your youthfulness and to become a young person in whatever circumstances, conditions provide. Why did you make that choice? It was very interesting. It was probably the heady years, you know, very much influenced by Zimbabwe just having attained their independence, 1980. I had the benefit, together with a group, we were a group of five um, young women with a teacher, Pfizer Bardin, Lucian Abrams, Mavis Amanis, um, and... Uh, it was myself and there was one other, its uh, name has just slipped my mind for a moment. We decided we were going up to Zimbabwe in June. It was immediately after independence, but it was also because my aunt, who had been uh, initially self-exiled, was coming down to 
then, mind you, Rhodesia still, it was before the name change. And uh, she was with a group called the NOVA, uh, a not-for-profit organization. And I had not seen her since I was seven years old. And, you know, it was opportunity. Zimbabwe had its independence and we were going to go up and see that. Now, being with NOVA, my aunt had access to the assembly points because they were going to provide um, uh, um, support uh, to the ex-combatants and all. And this was done together with the Zimbabwean government and the ruling party. So a group of us, the group of us went up. We went to see what it was like. And it was, as I said, quite heady. And yeah, you know, you go to these assembly points, met with both Zipra and Zanla, former combatants. And, you know, they came back. I mean, it was quite something. And, and the discussions they had and why with the Zanla group they went to, to join what they called the Chimurenga and all. And that set me thinking that, uh, you know, it wasn't just going to be the mass democratic struggle that will lead to fundamental change in society. Because we were at that point in cells in the Western Cape. So we were in a reading groups. I was at Livingston High School before I got to university. And we had uh, a reading group and, you know, used to read uh, dialectics and read the German ideology and various things. And I think you may remember that there was this bookshop in Cape Town where open books, where you would get the banned books from behind the counter, but you needed the right code to be able to purchase books. So we had been reading Long and all. Hey? In Long Street. In Long Street, yes. Um, we had gone to the Little Theatre, John Carney and all that. But it was also just the kind of environment we were in 1976, post-76. Um, in 1980, it was the Fatties and Moni strike that uh, um, we had been uh, involved in and supporting. We supported the meat workers strike as well. So being exposed to all this, I thought, no, 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 no. You know, maybe there was a need to tool myself differently. And um, we decided we were going to leave the country. There was uh, a young man called Patrick Chigora, who was uh, from UWC as well. And we were giving a, given a link to a contact in uh, Botswana. So we were going to go into ANC structures, trained and reinfiltrated almost immediately. So, you know, everything was supposed to go in that way. Of course, with the links, we then, um, the contact wasn't there in Khabarone as uh, supposed to when the train entered. Um, so we continued to Harare because that's where I had some contacts. So I um, made uh, a contact with the ANC in Zimbabwe. And through that, worked with uh, Comrade Joe Kabi. There's a long story about that, but that's how it went out. But a lot of it was the idealism of youth that I don't really regret, you know. And the only difference is I thought I would be back in the country by 1981, building the structures internally. Of course, the story was a little bit different. Um, some of it was very hard and very difficult. Um, and part of it was the assassination of Joe Kabi in July of 1981. Um, there was also, of course, the fact that I then instead worked from a forward area, from a frontline state as uh, Zimbabwe, Botswana, Lesotho, Swaziland, Mozambique, um, and Angola were known at that point, Zambia as well. So worked from there and built structures for the ANC from outside the country. So we were involved in building both political and military structures. And yes, I did do the military training. I did specialized training in different countries as well. And I think there's a number of um, uh, cadres then all over the country that have probably been exposed 
to training that I had conducted with them, who have been engaged in quite sensitive internal work in South Africa, built illegal structures of the ANC. And there were a number of people who made sacrifices, whether they were inside South Africa in underground structures, whether they were in the mass democratic movement, whether they served time on the island or they were in exile. I mean, our um, liberation, our freedom never came easy. And that's why it's necessary for us really to defend this constitution of ours and to nurture this democracy because people lost their lives. People's lives were actually destroyed in different ways because it was not simple. And this is for all sides. You were almost destroyed when there was indirect allegations or a smear campaign that you somehow directly or indirectly were, were culpable for Joe Mugabe's assassination. How did you manage that? That must have been quite a sense of who's trying to betray you. <laughs> I don't know if it was so much of how did I manage that, but I think it's also about, uh, you know, personal integrity. But let me start uh, by that. Um, with the assassination of Comrade Joe Kabi, there were two, uh, two of us together with a couple who found him the night he was assassinated. So it was the night my, the aunt that I saw in June, she had come back to Zimbabwe because she was now uh, um, awarded a contract with the Nova to actually work in Zimbabwe for a period of two years. So she arrived in Zimbabwe, I think that was the 31st of uh, July um, 1981. Now you need to check 30 or 31st. I always have a bit of a blank on this particular one. So she was coming in. My mother was also in Zimbabwe because about a month before, um, Ellen Busak had come to Harare. And, was, and you know, Ellen Busak was part of the structures of the movement at that point in time and part of the underground structures. And Comrade Joe Tabi, unbeknown to me, when he met with Alan Busak, he said to Alan before he left, he said, um, uh, uh, you know, Geraldine will be leaving Zimbabwe for a period of time. So if her parents want to see her, they should come now because she should be leaving in the next two weeks or so. Alan lived in Glenhaven. My parents lived in Glenhaven as well. So Alan uh, got a message to my parents uh, to say this. Now, my parents had no contact with me for about a year at that point. And they then decided my mother would come to Arari. I knew nothing about it. So, of course, the cover for my mother's coming was that my aunt was coming to Zimbabwe, her younger sister, who she had not seen since 1967, and that's 1981. So, of course, she applied for a passport and all came to Zimbabwe. And I uh, was sent off on an errand on the day when she had arrived in Zimbabwe, knew absolutely nothing. And, of course, when I got to the office, you know the ANC office in Angua Street, was above a furniture shop, a second-hand furniture shop. So people who went into the office, it was as though they were going into a furniture shop and checking furniture. But it was through this furniture shop that you got upstairs to the office. And I think they brought my mother in in that way. You know, she could have entered, I think, either from the back or the, from the front. So when I came back, I was told, oh, Comrade Joe wants to see you next door. And when I go next door, lo and behold, there's my mother. So anyway, going back to the night of the assassination, we had dinner that night with uh, a couple, with the Salbanis. It was Professor Salbani, who was a professor of mathematics at the University of Zimbabwe. Actually, this was the day before uh, Professor Salbani had uh, uh, professor of mathematics, his wife Lucilia is an uh, interpreter. So we had dinner with the family the night before. 
And then my aunt was coming the following evening from the Netherlands. We borrowed the Salbani's car, a station wagon. And we went to fetch them from the airport. And then we went to a place called Bombay Duck. Bombay Duck is on the main road. I think it's Samora Mashal Avenue. It was the place to go. When we got to Bombay Duck, all their suitcases, I mean, they're coming for two years, so the whole back of the car is filled with suitcases. My aunt, her husband, um, and two sons were in the car. So we went at Bombay Duck. There's a long queue outside. So he said, no, we can't be here. My mother's with us. Well, you don't also want to be seen because my mother needs to go back into the country. So we phoned the house and Comrade Joe was still at home. So we said, look, can we bring a takeaway and have dinner? So we go and we have this, uh, go to the Ashdown Park house, go into the house and we have dinner there. This is without Salbanis. It's Kabelo Makobo is driving, myself. My mom, my aunt, her husband, and two children in this car. So we went there. We left the house after dinner, and we actually sang Kosi Sikalele. There's one photograph of that fateful night of the whole group that I have a copy of. It's not a very good photograph, you know, that was taken. So anyway, we take this photograph and we leave. We must have left there. I think it's after eight or ten, nine, I can't even remember the exact time. And we then took my aunt and them to where they were staying out in Malfit. Uh, it's outside Arari, about 40 kilometers out towards the east, you know, um, where they were staying. So anyway, we drive back. We left my mother, we left my aunt and her husband, and we drive back that night. And as we drive back, we pick up the couple whose car was borrowed and uh, they drive with us to the house. Now, when we got to the Ashdown Park house, the gates were open and the Toyota Cressida was sort of parked in a slanting way in the, at the bottom of the driveway. Now, we had always had a way in which we checked the security of the place. Now, the fact that the gate was open was a sign of trouble. So Cabello and I got out of the car. I walked towards the front door to unlock and Cabello walked straight to the car. As he got to the car, he shouted and said, Geraldine, run. So I knew there was something wrong. So I ran to the car, stopped the car because they were pulling off. And I said to them, look, there's something wrong. I don't know what's happened. And I then said to uh, Sergio, to Professor Salbani, do you mind? getting out, let Cabello drive, because, I mean, he was a trained cadre by that stage. I had simply had training in Zimbabwe. I hadn't gone for specialized training yet. So we drove, we drove to Menangagwa's house, got a bit lost, went to the Sidemen's place to check on a, a map, and then got to uh, Minister Emerson Manangagwa's house. And when we got to the house, because um, Comrade Joe had always said to us, if anything happens, Manangagwa is the contact person. And we drove there, you know, cell phones, we didn't have those days. The, the best you had was that bleeper, you know, the, that bleeper thing. Bleeper. Yeah, and that. So anyway, um, went to Minister Manangagwa and he then, said to Kabilo, look, you've got to wait for the head of uh, um, intelligence at that point, you know, so he had to wait for him. And the minister drove with me alone with an AK-47 in his Mercedes-Benz to Ashdown Park. When we got to Ashdown Park, we parked in the driveway and he then said to me, sit in the car. And he walked down the driveway to the car he looked around the house. He first cocked his weapon, this AK. Then he came back to the car. Well, as he was walking back, I got out and walked to him. And he, I said to him, how's Comrade Joe? And he said, he's dead. And I must tell you, I flipped. I said to him, it's not possible. How do you decide he's dead? You're not a doctor. And said all kinds of things that uh, 20 turning, 21 year old shouldn't be saying to any 
a senior official or cabinet minister because I said, well, if it's the case, then it means you guys are responsible and so on and so on. And then stopped. And then I said to him, but how do you know? So he said to me, I've seen enough people die to know this. And of course, I mean, at that point it didn't. The others took oh, some time to come and it felt like forever. I mean, it's like, you know, when it just seems like hours and hours, you know, that you're waiting for the rest to come. So the police came because I said when we were in um, Mount Pleasant, which is where Minister Manangagwa stayed, I said, look, you need to get ambulance, you need to, you know, get people there. So, of course, it took a little while, the police came, everybody came, and whilst we were waiting, I said to Minister Menangagwa, look, there's a briefcase in that car, because Comrade Joe was due to meet comrades that night who were on the route to Botswana, and he had his briefcase in the car, and in his briefcase he had documents and he had his Makarov pistol. But in the car he also had the long playing records, you know, LPs. There were, I think, three LPs that he was sending to his wife or something like that. So I said to the minister, look, will you please make sure that when whoever comes, they give me this back and I will hand it over to the ANC leadership when they come, because they should open the bag, you know. And Minangagwa agreed. Now, all this counted against me, because how can a 20 turning 21-year-old be so precise and say this? And I also said to him, if you are going to search any premises, make sure there's one of the ANC people with you. So, for example, if you search the ANC office, there must be someone present. He agreed. It was at that point at night, and this is between midnight and four in the morning, that he then said, look, there was a meeting of the frontline states, ministers of intelligence and security. And you can check, it should be there for the record, the records in the archives. And he then said that he would take Kabelo with him to that meeting so that he could brief the ANC leadership because he was going on a personal flight. And I was staying behind because, look, I am the untrained one. So you take the trained cadre who had uh, already come from Lusaka and that I hadn't been so that he could meet and do this briefing. So all this was done. I also said to him, last thing is don't have any media announcement until the ANC contacts Mark Abi and Aurelia was based in... Botswana at that point in time. Now, unbeknown to me, you know, things always go awry. Um, so they fly off to Lusaka, and I stay in the house with Mike Overmeyer and his wife, Rachel, at the time, Rachel Stewart. They waited with me in the house because we didn't want to leave the house alone in case there's a phone call. I'm leaving the bit when the body was removed from the car and stuff like that. And then a phone call comes from Botswana and it's Violet Gwangwa on the line. You know, uh, um, the Moose, Moose, uh, Jonas Gwangwa's wife, who was a very close friend of uh, uh, Noma Zotshua, Aurelio Kabi. Uh, and she phones and she says to me, Geraldine, is what we hear true? This is around one o'clock, two o'clock in the afternoon. So I said, what did you hear? She says, no, we've heard on the radio RSA that Joe Kirby was assassinated. Is this true? So I said, but hasn't the headquarters got hold of you? She said, we got no phone calls. So I said to her, sadly, it is true. He's been assassinated. And of course, it was quite a thing because Maatabi was on night shift. So she was coming home from night shift when she turned on the radio. So, of course, what it turned out was the lines were down between Lusaka and Botswana. And we assume, I mean, the most logical thing was the South Africans were behind it. The South Africans also wanted to claim victory. So victory was we've killed the kingpin because they've tried so to South Africans, the apartheid government. The apartheid government, and it, I mean they had spent uh, sent a special unit in, 
And they, for years, had tried to kill him. You must remember Comrade Joe had served 15 years on Robben Island. He was asked to leave the country when there were attempts on his life inside South Africa. So they had tried before. There was the Pretoria 12 trial that had Murphy, Murphy Murobe, uh, Murphy Mulobe, and uh, no, Murphy Murobe, and Tokyo Sehwale, that trial where they, where the, they thought they had a state witness and they couldn't get evidence. So, of course, they tried to to put him away before that and they couldn't do that. And they tried in Zimbabwe as well, but failed because in February of that year, they had placed a car bomb. They had placed a bomb under the car and the very Cabello Makobo had seen it and it was diffused by the Zimbabwean uh, bomb squad. So they had tried and I mean, if that bomb went off, it would have demolished part of the house. I mean, they, later they bombed that house again, you know, so they had tried these things. So anyway, fast forward, so there we are. Um, uh, everything uh, sort of went according to plan. Uh, the ANC sent two members, uh, 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 Mam Posho um, came, uh, they sent someone who was going by the name of Peter Mataban. So the two of them were sent to take care of things. So of course when they came, I gave them the briefcase. They had the keys to the office, you know, we were there. Wherever the police wanted to go or the special branch, they were taken to those places and so on. And lo and behold, we had the funeral. The funeral was on, I think it was August 9th of 1981, and that was the funeral where Oliver Tambo said, um, yesterday was Ma Matola, today is Ashdown Park, tomorrow will be Pretoria. And if you look back, Fuertreko Wuchte attack took place post, you know, because it was, uh, we're taking it to you, the struggle. But after the funeral and all, on my 21st birthday, on the 24th of August, I go to the ANC office. And when I'm in the office, we're all in the office, there's a knock at the door. And of course, the door is opened. And in comes the Zimbabwean special branch. It was someone called Inspector Farkefisser and Inspector McCullum, I think it was. And they come in together with a woman, a white woman, special branch uh, officer, because they thought I was going to resist. So they brought her in and then they came in and they said they're there to arrest me. And I looked around and there were two leaders of the ANC there, Florence and Porsche, and Peter Polas. I looked at them and I said, um, are you aware of it? So I said, yes. So they said, yeah, we're arresting you for the assassination of Joe Kabi. So I said, well, if the ANC leadership is here and they're aware of it, then I go. Now, they had brought this woman because they thought I was going to arrest, uh, resist arrest. I don't know why I was going to jump through the first floor window and jump down or do what, I don't know. So they arrested me and they took me to Chikarubi prison, the maximum security prison in Zimbabwe. I think Chikarubi is notorious for what it is. Um, and there, of course, um, you know, uh, there was interrogation and under interrogation. No, first, let me say, the first thing they did was they took me to the central police station. And when I went into the office of uh, these special branch offices, on there are two chairs in front of the desk, and one of the chairs had the Uzi, it was the Israeli Uzi um, machine gun, which was one of the weapons. I think there were three weapons that were used to shoot Comrade Joe, because he had 22 rounds in his body. I mean, they shot him. I mean, there was no chance that he would have survived that, you know. So the one weapon was in the one chair, and the other chair they told me to sit, and I think it was again to look at the response uh, to this. And there they started their initial interrogation and said, 
and and my recollection at of it at the time, and this is some years back, was that they said we're framing you for the murder of Joe Kabi. And you know the questions they asked at nothing. Initially it was preliminary, what did you do? Where were you? And in any case, they had taken statements of my aunt and her husband and everyone, because we were at places we were accounted for. And thereafter, they were interested in the structures of the ANC in Zimbabwe, the structures in uh, Botswana, the structures in South Africa. And I said, but this has got nothing to do with the uh, assassination. Um, they were also very interested in the political education of the ANC. What was it? that we were trained in because I was a university, I was in my second year at university and they were, had the experience, the Rhodesians at least, of the mass, you know, the Pungues where many people were taken out and, you know, villages may have gone into Mozambique and younger people were taken out and literacy levels may have been different. So there we had discussions about Palo Fre and the pedagogics of the oppressed. So, I mean, it's quite a bizarre thing, this. Oh, so narrative. this is, yeah, like the discussion about it. They wanted to understand this. And at one point during the interrogation, this uh, Farkafisser said to me, but Geraldine, you know, you are 21. We can take you back to South Africa. You can go back. Because, you know, you don't know what, you, what would have happened to you at the age of 40. Besides that, the ANC says they don't know you. Look, uh, you were arrested in the office, the leaders were there. Now, of course, it was to create doubt in my mind because I had asked the question in the room. And of course, I was a bit annoyed that nobody told me before and that, look, potentially I could get arrested that day. And I said to them, let the ANC decide, I'm not going to get into that. But besides that, I knew that even if people claimed the ANC didn't know me, I knew who I was, how I got into the movement and all. And then of course, fast forward um, about, I was in solitary confinement for 17 days. And I think it was around day 15 when uh, there was in the Zimbabwe. special, in Zimbabwe, at in Harare, because I was also, for the first part of my solitary confinement, I was in Chikarubi prison. Then they moved me from Chikarubi prison. I didn't know why. And they moved me to the cells at the central police station. At the time, I thought it was probably closer for them to continue interrogation when they wanted to. I must tell you, I felt more vulnerable at the central police cells than at Chikarubi because Chikarubi prison was structured, you know, um, and much as I was in solitary confinement, there were women wardens. I mean, it's a maximum security prison, but it was different. At the cells in, at the central police station, you know, you had policemen there with police women, but the weekends were a problem. And I managed to convince the police women during the day when the cells were filled with people who were in for petty theft to get them to put the women with me because I was worried about the wardens who went sober at night, the police, and, and, and I was more scared about my physical harm than anything else. I mean, it scared me terribly. I think also solitary does weird things to you, you know, it's to be alone. It's, it's, it's not a nice thing and not to see light where the light just comes through the top. That's a small thing, really. So anyway, I was then brought up from the cells again and told um, these visitors, and it was actually the first visit I have. And of course, to my absolute surprise, in the office again was Inspector McCullum, Inspector Farkafisser, but was Alfred and Zoe, the Secretary General of the ANC, John Motsabi, a member of the, uh, 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 what was it called, PMC, the Political Military Council of the ANC, and Tabo Mbeki, who was also part of the larger 
political uh, military council, or I think it was called Revolutionary Council at the time. But he was the person that I had known because he, together with Comrade Joe, had actually built relations with the Zimbabwean government and ZANU-PF. So, of course, they were there. And I mean, so it was, you know, so the ANC doesn't know me. And yet three senior leaders of the ANC have come to Zimbabwe. And Kabelo was there as well with two bags of chocolates and groceries. They just bought things. I think all of them had experience in prison. So they all knew what you bring when you uh, come in at the time. And of course, uh, Farkafis and McCullum was very, were very impatient that they should cross-examine me. And they said to them, aren't you going to ask her questions? And uh, they said, no, when he, she's released, we'll have all the time to find out what happened? We don't need to cross question her in your company. And they were telling different stories. And of course, everybody was telling a story when they were in prison and what happened and all. But then uh, the president, uh, uh, Comrade Tabumbeki, um, said to me, why don't you go and have a look what's in the bags? Uh, Kavelo, show her what's in the bags. And I went to the bags and, uh, of course, I knew it was to say. And I just said to Cabello, I didn't see him for Shani, didn't talk about him for Shani. I didn't talk about anybody because they had asked about someone called him for Shani. It's a comrade, Freddie Mninza. He was on death row in Zimbabwe. He was part of the wanky comrades. And that, and uh, Comrade Freddie Mninza, Comrade Mfishani, was involved in the networks in Zimbabwe at the time and involved in the security and intelligence networks. Well, of course, I was released two years, two days later. I then went to see uh, um, the then head of the Air Force, um, Josiah Tungamirai, who was a friend. I'm talking too long. Stop what you're saying is a rubber team. <laughs> a rubber team. Mm -hmm. So you were released? I was released. I was PI'd from Zimbabwe, so I was declared a prohibited immigrant. I had to leave for Lusaka. I went to Lusaka. And I stayed in Lusaka for six weeks before I went on to Angola. In Lusaka, I did the debrief, but I had first done a debrief to Josiah Tungamira, and I went to see him immediately, because for me, it was clear that the Zimbabwean security forces was infiltrated by the South Africans from the questioning. So I simply went to tell him what the line of questioning was. Went to Zimbabwe, I was met by Joe Medici, okay. no, Zimbabwe, uh, some Zambia, Zambia, uh, Joe Medici, Mzwai Piliso, by various members of the leadership who met me there. They did the debrief, we went through everything. Joe Medici tried to discourage me at that point from going to military training. And he said to me, why don't you go and study? But you know, having been through that experience and with the assassination, I was so angry that nothing was going to change my mind. So after six weeks, despite all the attempts, I went on to Angola. I went for um, first uh, training in one of our front camps called Gashito in Vienna in Angola, it's outside Luanda. I later, after I did that initial training, which went for about three to four months, I was brought back to Luanda, to a um, safe house in Luanda. That's where I met uh, Jabu Muleketi. We uh, went on training together. We went on specialized training to the then Soviet Union. And uh, the rest is history. That's riveting. So you move from some, you're in Zimbabwe, you go to Zambia, you go, you go to Angola. 
and as the historic record shows, been been to Cuba. No, I first went to Soviet Union, to Soviet Moscow. Union. We were trained there, and then? and then come back to Africa, so Angola, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and I worked from Zimbabwe with internal structures and uh, worked with the building of internal structures. So there's some people so who happened? bump into me in uh, Cape Town and call me commandeer, you know, yes. so. What happened to you? You, you, give, you give us a very rich history about the developments around you, the ANC, underground structures, military structures, political training, military training, and the countries that were you involved where you were at, but surely something happened with you. What happened with you? It's part of was part of my growth. The, the person of the left at the age of 18, 19, 20 at UWC, at the University of Western. 20. 20. And then you were in Buffalo. What happened with you? Well, you know, I suppose if you talk with my siblings or friends or my parents, my father's late, they'd always say that I was quite tough, that I was always ready to buck the trend. Um, you know, I was 14 years old when I had my first action of public disobedience, if you can call it that, because at that point, my father was a principal at the uh, children's home in Fora, you know, so we couldn't stay with them during the week. So I stayed with my granny who stayed in Klipfontein. I, you know where Crossroads is now? Klipfontein is just beyond that. So my granny stayed in Klipfontein and we would take the bus to Livingston from uh, the bus stopped and started at that. It's beyond Philippi area. You know, those days we thought that's far away and now it's all built up there. So we used to take the bus. So we used to go up and down with a bus. It was my sister Debbie, my younger sister, and my brother Arthur. You know, so we used to get on the bus in the morning. Uh, Arthur was at, um, uh, is it Rosmeet? Uh, next to Livingston, the primary school, you know. We were at Livingston High, the two of us, so we used to take the bus every day. Now, you know, the front two rows in the bus, if it's a single decker, was always open for white people. And the rest of the bus was full bus. Now, we get onto the bus at the first stop, and I can tell you, as soon as we get to Philippi or Manenberg, that bus is full. And of course, we always had to stand up for adults. So you must know you must stand from Manenberg right through to Claremont. And I mean, the bus didn't drive fast, so it took quite a while, that bus ride. And then we debated this, and we were also a bit unkind because, you know, close to Livingston, when we took the bus in the afternoon, there was this... Um, is it Batavia School? You know, school for children who had were handicapped. And inevitably, this school was a school for white handicapped kids. So we used to have these running battles on the bus with these kids saying, you know, you think you're privileged, what do you think you are? And, you know, all kinds of debates on that bus. And uh, anyway, one fine day, one fine morning, I just thought after I had stood up and all these adults are standing in the bus, not one adult is sitting on these empty seats and nobody is there policing them closely. So I decided I'm going to sit. And the bus driver, because he wasn't a driver and a conductor, it was just the bus driver because it was a single-decker bus. You know, the bus driver stops. Uh, no, he first says to me, you must get up. You know you're not allowed to sit there. So I said to him, why? And he says, you know why you're not allowed to sit there? So I said, no, I'm not getting up. Why can't I sit? And of course I knew. And he stopped the bus, and of course the adults started grumbling. Get, uh, get up, you know, you're making us late for work and all. I said, I'm not getting up, I'm sitting. Now my sister and brother's on the bus. The driver then gets out, gets out, you know, opens that thing up, 
gets out and he physically takes me out and puts me on the side of the road. Now, you know, we had clip cards. So, you know, the clip card worked where you had a clip uh, just once a day. So, of course, I was stuffed. There was no pocket money. And there was nothing I could do. There I stand on the side of the road near Brown's farm. And I'm standing there and I thought, what am I going to do? Because firstly, even if I walk to school, I'm going to get to school late. If I don't go to school, I'm in trouble. Either way, I'm stuffed. What am I going to do? And because I had my school blazer on, the Livingston blazer, my then Afrikaans teacher, Mr. Jacobs, was courting his wife in that area of Brown's farm. So he sees me, he stops for me and he says, Geraldine, what's verkeerd met jou? Jy, jou oor flam, wat het gebeur? Clemens, I get in and I explain to him what happened, you know. So of course that was the first act and I mean there I was more worried about being in trouble with my granny and my parents and school than I was around the action I took. Also, I, I was part of the South Peninsula Educational Fellowship, you know, it was this whole, you know, Teachers League at Ran Spef. Um, and, and Livingston itself as a school was a school that we thought uh, prepared you for larger society. So we knew the secret history and all. But I also came from a family where both from my mother and father's side, there had been, you know, a great awareness. So you sit around the kitchen table and when they play dominoes or clever jazz, you have every political issue of the day being discussed and you hear that the innerste goeie boer is a dweie boer and that kind of thing, you know, so it was there. So I think it was there. But look, this was... The incident of Arari was different. The growth was different. And I was told by a, a young woman that I shared a room with in um, Angola. She said to me, I spoke in my sleep, but she couldn't understand what I was talking about. So I suppose it was the reaction to the assassination, having found Comrade Joe, it was the arrest and, and everything that went with it. But you know, at that time, when you're 21, who's going to tell you that you're not, uh, I mean, you think you're infallible, man. You think you know it all. Master, uh, you, you, you came back and after coming from exile, mm -hmm. you with a, a number of others, and then you got into government you were put in an extremely difficult situation at times with your comrades. You had to negotiate with probably one of the most powerful unions on the planet. On the, on the planet. On the planet. <laughs> the uh -huh. trade unions. Um, with the then Secretary General, Ravi. And quite clearly you were in one of the toughest roles. But you were quite uh, negotiating with conviction on the salaries of, of the behavior on the one hand, to take on a, 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 a probably a male-dominated negotiating team from, from Kosato, on behalf of government you negotiated. So in the, in, in the public, you were like very position, you took a position on given by the mandate of the, your, probably your, your the government. Let, let me say, yeah, let, let me say a few things on what that. There? Let me say a few things. Um, <coughs> I'll start there and then I want to step back and come back into it. You know, my late father-in-law had a term he called him Simbi Aigobi, which means, I think, loosely the steel that doesn't bend mm -hmm. and I think to a large extent when I look at where I come from and look we didn't talk about my childhood we didn't talk about the family I was from we didn't talk about what informed my convictions but it was all about social justice 
economic justice. It was building a society that has no discrimination against people and actually standing quite firm on integrity and saying that if we need to attain X goal, we must work towards it. So that's always been something that's driven me. And you've heard snippets as I spoke about, and you know none of this is easy. There's nothing, it, it's much easier looking at me today than it is walking that journey with me, you know, if you look at that. So that's one thing. I think the second thing is I didn't come back in a group. I was sent back because I came back as part of a decision by the party that in the rebuilding of legal structures, you know, there's a need to rebuild the party's legal structures. So even before my indemnity, I came in on a flight wasn't quite sure what was going to happen, but that's a whole different story. So we fast forward. Um, I must say, I was, I didn't expect the affirmation by the movement for me to hold the portfolios that I did. I was incredibly humbled by it, and I saw a need to really understand what it is that I had to do. So come to public service, other than whilst I was Minister for Welfare and Population Development, when I served on the, the Cabinet Committee that was set up to look at the uh, um, Nkomo report that was looking at the re-visioning uh, of the public service. It wasn't something I'd really looked at. And I mean, much as I understood the importance of the public service having been Minister for Welfare, I didn't deal with the nitty gritty. So I actually sat down with four people, two of them being trade union leaders, where I said, listen guys, from today I am public service minister and you need to tell me in two weeks everything I need to know and understand about the public service. From the trade union leader side, of course, it was to look at the labor relations and all that kind of thing so that we could see how to deal with it. My suppose, if I, oh, I haven't unpacked things, okay. So, um, one. Thank you, uh, <laughs> no, it's just that I changed my position <laughs> and when he was standing up. So, I had to go in there, but I was very clear on certain things. I had the mandate of cabinet. I had the mandate of the president. In all that we were looking at in terms of the remuneration framework of public servants, these were developed within government and we had consultations with trade union leaders. So when we went into negotiations and there were three, during my tenure, there were three major strikes. The one was the year I came into public service, that was 1999. The next one was three years later because we managed to negotiate a three-year agreement. And then the last one was the fateful 2007 strike. That strike was political. And one day I will write, and I'm sure Zwellen Zimavavi will write, Tulas Nessi will write, um, uh, A.B. Witboy will write, as well as uh, Slovo Majola, um, because all of them know that what the media saw and what they said did not capture the discussions we had, because the public service, uh, public sector coordinating bargaining council was where the negotiations took place at the level of unions and government. But throughout the night, we would cross night with the then ANC Secretary General, Halima Mutlante, and meet with union leaders, Bavi was there and the others that I had mentioned, and we debate through the night. It was very clear to us at a point that this wasn't a strike around remuneration and benefits of public servants. It was a strike that was in the build-up to Pulakwane. And at the end of the day, you know, everything is about principle. And you need to be principled because, at the, because we all know that public servants aren't the only beneficiaries of the government 
costs uh, of the overall taxes of government. Uh, the government fiscus wasn't only to look at public servants. We had to look at services, we had to look at infrastructure development and all that, and you needed to look at the share. So as I engaged, I wasn't engaging at a personal level. It wasn't Geraldine versus Walensi Mavavi, in spite of Zapiro's cartoons, and I must say I loved them. He actually initialed a uh, copy of one for me, because I think you need to have a sense of humor as well, or else the life will be miserable. It's about principle. So it's saying, comrades, we indeed are in trenches together, and the table is oval. The table wasn't square or a rectangular table, it was an oval table, but we need to be able to say that what are the priorities for government at a given point in time? And you can't always be populist about it. So unfortunately, Geraldine is not just seen as populist about it. Do, do you think that, that when people look at you during your time as Minister of Welfare and Minister of Public Service, they always had the, and that's connecting with the Sapiro cartoon, that you, you're very animated when you, you give expression to things that you believe in, but also when you take a stance. Why, why, you, why do you go in, in... Tell them how do you get to that, where Geraldine like, speaks and really take a stand around matters, so you do it in heart, soul and mind. Um, what happens during that period? Well, I don't know if what something informs happens. What informs is my commitment to what the end goal is. Um, yeah, I, I don't find it unusual. I think when you take on a task, you must take it on and be committed to it. Otherwise, you must step out of public service. You don't do things for yourself. For as long as I was in public service and now in the African Development Bank, my commitment is much broader than myself. And, and if I feel that it's waning, that's when you step out. I don't think you do things just because it's a job. You need to do it because there's a value to it, because you have a vision around it, and because you believe in it. You, you were a member of the Communist Party. Yes, I was. You were a member of the African National I Congress. I am a member of the African so National you were Congress. Both, um, both NECs. Yes, I was serving in the Central Committee and Politburo of the South African Communist Party. I was the first woman a deputy chair of the South African Communist Party. I lapsed my membership of the Communist Party because it was clear that the vision and direction of the party was not what um, I was recruited into. And mind you, when I, I was recruited into the party, so I had to go through a probation period. I didn't apply to join the party, and it was a different party. And when it became a bit personal, when I felt that the party was fighting the person rather than the issues, I thought I'd step out for the good of the party. With the ANC, I'm a member of the ANC. I was in the leadership of the ANC until Pulakwane in... Uh, 2008. Um, I have been in the branch leadership of the Sonia Bunting branch until I uh, served uh, the UN as Director of Democratic Governance Practice. And I feel you can't hold the leadership position if you're not able to service that position completely. So when I come back from next year, who knows? In, 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 in South Africa, when you were quite active, at the national international platform in terms of the South African government. You were a minister. Yes. You were serving on the NEC, ANC, ANC, ANC. that's correct. You were serving on the ANC's national, national um, working committee. No, I didn't serve okay. in the national working committee. I didn't accept okay. a nomination. Okay, broadly, African National Congress, NEC, Central Committee of the Communist Party. You were, you were a member of the South African cabinet. Yes. Three different positions, probably three different ideological outlooks. How did you navigate that? You know, look, the ANC is always 
the broader based organization. And we understood that, you know, and there was never a contradiction around duality of membership. And I think it's always been clear about it. Remember I said that I was recruited into the South African Communist Party when I was a member of the African National Congress. And one then had a deeper uh, learning and studying of a broader ideology around Marxism at that point in time. Um, being in the NEC of the ANC, I mean, the Freedom Charter has always been the blueprint that has really underpinned our thinking. And if I think back even to the time in Angola, when we went through our political education, the whole issue was around the Freedom Charter. And mind you, the one issue that South Africans must never forget and members of the ANC should never forget, we never served the ANC. We serve the people of South Africa. Because as members then of Umkonto Wesizwe, and mind you, Umkonto Wesizwe was disbanded. So as members of Umkonto Wesizwe, ours was to serve. And as the Freedom Charter says, we clearly saw ourselves as serving the people of South Africa because we said that no legitimate government could claim authority unless it is based on the will of the people. And I think sometimes people forget that. So duality, never. Schizophrenia, no. You know, I was clear on the roles at given points. And that's why I lapsed my membership when I felt that there was a potential conflict. I'm going to ask you three last questions. I can't get away from it. Give them a signal also. They're trying to stop me. You chose, and the last one will be about your children and your family, but you chose to respond to a letter from Vivi Mandela when she was making allegations about the females in the cabinet relative to the president, Thabo Mbeki at the time. What informed you to make that choice? What was the drivers behind you making that choice to make a public statement about it? You know, you know, you should never be silent when you feel there's a need to speak out. And I regrettably felt it was a moment where the allegations that were made suggested or could have been interpreted that the women who were serving weren't serving on the basis of their capability. And I thought there was a need to see it set the record straight. There was nothing else that informed it. And I think that I would uh, do that at any other point if I indeed believed that it was an unfounded uh, um, allegation or inference. So that was it, nothing more. And mind you, when you look at Mum Winnie, she's one of the leaders of our struggle. And I think someone we will always recognize for the selfless contribution she's made. And like everyone, we know that we all have difficult moments at different times. But I think at any point in time, we should also be able to engage and say, on this one, respectfully, we disagree, whilst recognizing the role that you've played. Your, your children, when they listen to you where you come from and your history um, as a young person going into exile and all the complexities that they've experienced around you um, and the newspaper reports and the TV and, the, and everything that's happened in the papers and, news, and uh, outside gets into your house because children are TV. Things negatively said about you, sometimes positively about you over the period. How, how did you manage that as a mother and, and as a partner? I almost wish you could ask my children, but uh, let me say two things about it. You know, for me, the home space is the space where your mom, this is where I'm Jabu's wife, this is where Jabu is my husband. I'm Makoti, or I'm a daughter, I'm a sister. This is a safe space. 
So all the fetters of public office or anything stops at the gate. It's mom at home. And this is the leveler to all that. Um, during some of the strikes, I think uh, when engaging with uh, my children, in particular the older two, I think they had snide comments made and they had to defend and all that kind of thing. But there was a time I think they just stopped watching the news. So for a certain period, they just don't watch the news. And they learn to deal with it. You know, kids are hardy, but they also knew that at home, they weren't the kids of a cabinet minister or deputy minister or MEC of finance. They were just molochettis at home. And the rules apply at home as required. So there's two non-negotiables. You've got to support pirates when you're part of this family. And there was also another non-negotiable that we're not talking about at this point in time, you know. So they were clear. Social justice, you've got to be committed to social justice. We don't have time. We don't have time. There's no space here for anyone who has any hang-ups that will be racist, homophobic, sexist, or whatever. No space in this home. So that safe space doesn't allow safety for uh, bigots, you know. What are, what are the three things that you will, you will tell your kids and other people's children, and, or our children? that matter um, and those who want to by either by working get into leadership positions or contesting the space in political parties and others to become in leadership positions with it. What, what, what would you tell them about what you have learned what are the three things that you will identify for them you must have integrity you must be committed you know you must be willing to even do the small things. Lick the stamps. And at the end of the day, you'll be able to make that new email program or something like that, you know? Also know that, uh, never forget to greet the guy that opens the gate for you or sweeps in the passages. There's no one too lowly and no one that's too important. At the end of the day, you need to be confident enough in yourself to engage. But perseverance is important. It doesn't no matter how long you take to complete something, but the strength of it will be in completion. I only completed my master's in 2006. I was 46 at that point in time. And I know many people ask me, why are you doing it? You don't really need it. I did for myself. So at the end of the day, it's to be willing to do the hard slog and know you'll get pushed back. But every, you know, every uh, challenge is a lesson for you and it makes you stronger. And every success, share it with everyone around you. Great. Geraldine Fraser, thank you very much. Thank you.